Well, good evening and welcome to our webinar for today, Unraveling the Mysteries of Financial Statements. I'm Peter Haley, a Director in Forensic here at Vincent's Chartered Accountants. And um, before we start, I'll just mention um, our expected time frame today is roughly an hour. And to uh, be able to do that, probably if you could have any questions, please um, type them in. But um, we might get back to you with the answers to those. Um, at a later date to make sure we can get through this in, in the allotted time frame. So there's a quick slide on the evolution of accounting, but um, while it's a cartoon, what it is supposed to illustrate is that accounting has not really changed for a very long time. The same basic rules that we follow today have been in practice for centuries, and uh, although the way of recording it has evolved from stone to uh, slate, to a com you know, to paper, uh, to uh, computers, the the accounting system itself is still essentially the same thing. So what we're actually going to cover today are definitions. What are these accounting formulas and rules? What is the double entry accounting system? Some examples of journals and ledgers so that you can actually see how a set of financial statements are constructed. And then the more interesting part for the second half will be manipulating how that's done legally because while there are various rules um, with, to do with accounting, there are also some grey areas and I suppose some options in terms of how you choose to um, treat particular transactions and then we'll just finish with some other issues to consider. Okay, so what is accounting? So there's a definition there, it's you know recording, classifying, summarising terms of money, transactions and events of financial character and interpreting the results thereof. So the first part of it is probably more the bookkeeping side and then accounting is also interpreting. So what's the basis of accounting? So, so it's based on this system called the double entry accounting system and the current system as we know it dates back to the Italian Renaissance in the early 14th century. So um, the the story is that as commerce evolved and as the Renaissance started um, happening, um, then things were being traded for money. People needed to somehow or other track what they were doing. And so um, an Italian monk developed this system of accounting, which is still basically what we use today with a system of debits and credits, which are um, old Latin names. So, but in fact, the actual double entry accounting system even goes back a couple of thousands of years. Some of the older civilizations had accounting systems not dissimilar to what is still in use today. So I suppose it's the old adage, you know, if it, if it ain't broke, don't try and fix it. So they found it works and, and that's the, the story today. So accounting is, yeah, per that definition before, is basically a system of classifying and summarizing individual transactions. So what you also need to be aware of on top of that, there are generally accepted accounting principles and that I haven't got it on the slide, but there's also things called accounting standards, which are sometimes brought up, which I'll um, mention in more detail a little later on. And finally, the result of all this accounting are financial statements and financial records, which is what we'll, um, which is the stuff that you normally see, the financial statements being profit and loss statements and balance sheets and so on. As I said there, what are the financial statements? So they are the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, and also the notes to the financial statements. Now a lot of small, medium businesses, the notes aren't very voluminous, but if anyone owns shares in public companies and you've ever looked at their annual report, the the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet are probably one page, maybe two pages each, but there'll be cross reference to various numbers on those balance sheets through to the notes which actually do provide all the detail and the notes can run to tens and tens of pages on a large company and the balance sheet really is a very basic summary document. So what are the financial statements? So the profit and loss statement. It's a summary of the trading activity, which is the revenue and expenses. And it's important to realize here it's for a defined period. So you'll normally see it headed for the year ended 30 June 2014, for example. So what that means is if you're looking at 
that profit and loss statement has got an item called sales for the year and it might be a million dollars. You don't know by looking at that, have they made one sale for a million dollars or a million sales of one dollar? The profit and loss statement doesn't tell you that. All it tells you is in total, the dollar value of all those sales was a million dollars. And I'll come to it later as to how you can find out what makes up the million dollars. So the profit and loss statement has revenue and expenses. So what's revenue? It's the inflow from provision of goods or services or from holding investments if it's a, um, an investment type entity. Expenses, the opposite, the outflow or outflow from holding investments. So inflow and outflow normally means off cash. So revenue, you're normally getting cash, but not necessarily. You, know, you can get paid in kind or um, you know, by way of other um, other, other forms. For example, a um, matter on my desk today where a, in a company that owned a property, a real property, sold it to a developer into another entity that was essentially the second entity was probably more in the nature of a joint venture type thing. So when the first company sold it, it got $900,000 in cash and it was deemed to receive 50% of the issued shares in the new entity, in the joint venture entity. So, but for stamp duty purposes for the transfer and for accounting purposes, the sale was recognised at $1.8 million, even though only 900,000 in cash got transferred. So that's just an example how revenue doesn't have to always be cash, but most commonly it is. And expenses, I'll come to a couple of examples there later on where not all expenses are necessarily cash outgoings, but as a rough rule of thumb, ordinarily think it's you know cash in, cash out, revenue expenses. So revenue minus expenses down the bottom there in green on the slide equals the net profit, or if your expenses are greater than your revenue, you have a loss, and then that flows through to the balance sheet, which I'll explain a little later on. What's a balance sheet? As it says, it's a balance of assets, liability and equity at a point of time. So whereas the profit and loss statement was for the year ended, the balance sheet will be as at 30 June 2014. So it's drawing a line in the sand at a particular point in time. So if you're looking at a balance sheet at 30 June 2014, it says cash at bank, that's how much cash was in the bank at close of business on that day. Stock, how much stock was on hand at close of business on that day. So what's an asset? It's an item of value owned by the entity important to realise here is there's a distinction between what's called current assets and non-current assets. So a current asset, you'll normally realise the benefit within 12 months. Non-current, the benefit is realisable over a period greater than 12 months. So a non-current asset would include, sorry, current asset would include such things as debtors. Hopefully you'll collect them within 12 months. Uh, work in progress, uh, inventory or stock, those two terms are interchangeable. Um, you sometimes hear it referred to as inventory, sometimes as stock. So again, hopefully all those things, you know, you'll convert all into cash within 12 months. The non-current assets are things such as plant equipment where you'll um, derive benefit from those for a period greater than 12 months. Liabilities, I think most people will be familiar with the concept, they're the amounts owed by the entity to external parties. Um, again, you've got the distinction between current and non-current, where current payment is due within 12 months, non-current greater than 12 months. Now a little bit differently here than whereas the non-current assets, the, the value might straddle from you know, zero to five years with a liability. If it does do that, well then the portion of the liability that reflects the next 12 months you actually stick in current and non-current is from year two onwards. So you'll sometimes see the same liability listed in both current and non-current and what that's saying is that you know, the next 12 months worth they're stuck in the current section and non-current becomes greater than that. And then finally on the balance sheet you've got equity which is the amount of the owner's interest or investment in the business. So. Again, the formula at the bottom in green there, asset minus liabilities equals equity, 
and that's sometimes also referred to as net assets. So again, if the liabilities are greater than the assets, you've got negative equity. So the other way of thinking of this is just like your own house. Your asset is your house, your liability is your mortgage. The difference between the two is your equity, which is hopefully positive. Um, so I mentioned briefly before about the financial statements notes. So um, what they do is provide additional financial information and explanation. And as I said, they could be um, quite voluminous in some entities. Um, but with smaller, medium enterprises, you'll often find the notes don't really have very much in them. A lot of, most of the detail is able to be provided on the balance sheet and the profit and loss statement. So it's just important to be aware that um, exactly how much detail the financial statements go into is dependent on whether the entity, you know, the company, the trust, the partnership, whatever it is, is what's called a reporting entity or a non-reporting entity. So a non-reporting entity is one that's deemed not to have any users outside of the owners, uh, outside of management and the owners who will have any use for the financial statements. So in which case they can essentially issue abbreviated form of financial statements. And um, whereas their reporting entities are more like public companies that have to have much more voluminous um, financial statements. Okay, so a bit of an example here. Now, normally if we were doing this um, in a workshop type environment, I'd um, ask you each to classify the following. So down the left-hand side, you've got various transactions. And down the right-hand side, you've got our options of what they might fall into from the uh, profit and loss statement and the balance sheet. So the first one there is advertising. So I think hopefully maybe you have a bit of a guess to yourself and see if you're right, but advertising is normally an expense. So it's something that involves us um, paying out money and uh, gaining the benefit within the next 12 months or so, hopefully. Prepaid advertising, sorry, on the other hand, is where we might pay in the old days when people had Yellow Pages ad, you might in June pay for the ad in the Yellow Pages, which is going to be in that directory for the next 12 months. So therefore you would treat that as actually prepaid advertising because you're going to get the benefit of that over the next 12 months. And in which case, if that's the case, that's actually an asset. And then every month you would allocate a, a bit of that asset, and decrease the balance of the asset and allocate it across into the expense and recognise that you're getting the benefit over that time and actually in the months to which the benefit relates, you're expensing it out. Third one there is accumulated depreciation. So I might just quickly mention depreciation. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with the term. And that's the process by which, um, similar to the prepaid advertising, a what's called a fixed asset, plant and equipment, machinery, uh, those sorts of things, motor vehicles, you might buy for $30,000. And I'll go through a detailed example later, but um, very roughly $30,000 got a five year life. At the end of the five years, it's probably not going to be worth anything. So really it's losing value of about $6,000 a year. So depreciation is recognizing that loss of value of the asset. So in year one, you would take up a depreciation expense item for $6,000. And then, as I'll explain soon, everything has to have another side of the entry. It's called double entry. And the other side of that is accumulated depreciation. And what it actually is is a negative asset. So if you're looking at the balance sheet, you see plant and equipment, less accumulated depreciation. That shows, gives some sort of indication as to how far through the life of the asset you probably are. So if you've got plant and equipment, $100,000 and accumulated depreciation of $2,000, you'd um, that indicates that the equipment's very new and still has a long life left in it. However, if you're looking at the balance sheet, Accumulated depreciation, hundred. Uh, sorry, value of plant and equipment, one hundred thousand dollars. Accumulated depreciation, ninety eight thousand dollars. That would seem to suggest the uh, equipment's been held for quite some time. It's quite old, and potentially, um, if you're analysing the business or, or the entity, 
might indicate they need to um, buy new equipment. They'll have a need to uh, either raise some funds by way of capital or equity and those sort of issues. Um, fourth one there, asset revaluation reserve. That's actually equity. So what that means is um, when you're looking at a balance sheet, typically the values you look, that are recorded there are the historical cost. What did it cost this entity, this company to buy that block of land or that building 10 years ago might have been $2 million. So every year on the balance sheet, when we first bought it, we would have brought it in at the $2 million it cost us. And every year it just sits there as an asset at $2 million. After 10 years, the directors say, well, hold on, that's really worth $10 million. We want the balance sheet to better reflect the true value of that building. So obviously, go back to our example of your house. If you want to recognise the increase in the act, in the um, the value of the asset, you haven't got any liability that's increasing. So what's if we remember our formula, at the bottom there, assets minus liabilities equals equity. So we're increasing the value of the asset. We don't have any increase in liability. So we have to reflect the other side of the entry. You'll often hear me talk about the other side of the entry being the double entry accounting system has to go to equity. Oops, sorry. Um, example five, resurface our bitumen driveway with cement. So three or four years ago, we put down a bitumen driveway, a bitumen um, sort of hard stand out the front of our factory, and the trucks have been coming in and out, and it's all broken up and falling to bits, and we're through to the dirt and whatever. So we decide that now we won't fix it with bitumen. That's not hard wearing enough. We need to put concrete or cement down. So the general rule is if we'd replaced it with something of the same um, um, sort of utility value, being bitumen again, then that would be a repair. However, if we go past that and improve it, that then becomes a new asset. So. For example, if we were writing off by way of depreciation the bitumen hard stand, well, suddenly we have it no longer. So we'd have to write off whatever balance of value of it had to reflect the fact that it's no longer there. And we would take up, when I say write off, we'd expense it. And we would take up the cement new hard stand as a new asset and start depreciating it. Finally, the sixth one there, pending lawsuit. Um, actually, I'll give you a clue. It's not actually one of the options on the right-hand side. So because it's only pending, it's what's called a contingent liability. So if you imagine on 30th of June, your client, your company, is um, receives a statement of claim from someone who has some grievance against it. Um, you haven't even had a chance to determine whether it's got any legs, uh, whether you have to pay anything out, um, etc. So there is no, the general rule is you recognise a liability when there is a legal obligation to pay the debt. So until such time as you have essentially either reached a settlement or there is a judgment against you, you would not recognise that as a liability. But um, in larger entities who have um, detailed notes to their accounts, they might record that as a potential liability or contingent liability it's called. Okay so the double entry accounting system what is it? Well it's the basis of all accounting so for every transaction you've got these things called debits and they must equal the total credits. Um, why are they called debits? Why are they called credits? Um, well everything just has to have a name there's no particular uh, magic to it that's just the name that was given to it by the 14th century Italian monk who invented this system. So before going into the debits and credits, I think we need to firstly look at what exactly is a ledger. So in the old days it was a book or a set of loose cards or a file of all the accounts. Now it's actually within the software of accounting software. So hopefully you're all familiar with things like MYOB, QuickBooks and various other accounting softwares. All those software is doing in, behind the scenes within the software is 
this system of debits and credits. So it's nothing magic just because it's on a computer. Um, it is still the same system that I'm about to explain that has been around for six or seven hundred years. So in the old days, back when I started accounting and everything was still handwritten, a debit was recorded if you had a, a book and you can imagine an account on it, everything, a debit was on the left hand side, a credit was on the right. So before we go into the ledger, in fact, we have to go back to the very start, which is a journal. And I'll come to an example how the journals flow through to the ledgers in just a sec. But first of all, the accounting rules. So assets are always of a debit nature, liabilities of a credit nature, and equity are of a credit nature. So algebraically that has to work because of our formula where assets equals our liability plus equity or flip that around your know, asset minus liability equals equity. Revenue then has a credit nature and expense has a debit nature. So these are just the rules. It's black and white. You can't change this. Some people get a little confused there that assets have a debit nature. And I think that goes back to the one, well people probably don't even get these documents necessarily anymore, but the one accounting document that non-accountants receive through their lifetime is a bank statement. And if you've got a savings account, when you get your statement from the bank, it has you know, $100 with a little CR beside it, so of a credit. So if that's your asset, being your savings account, why has it got a credit against it? And the answer to that is it's actually the bank's statement. So for them, it's a liability. That's why it's got a credit. The same as when you get your mortgage bank statements, they've always got a DR against them or a debit because it's your liability for the bank's asset and it's their statement that they're sending to you. Okay, so they're the rules, they're black and white. That example I went through earlier, these classifications are not necessarily quite so black and white. For example, the resurfaced bitumen with dry weight cement, and I'll come to that later when we're talking about manipulation. So when we say these things have a, a nature, increases to the account are recorded on the same side as the nature of the account and decreases on the opposite side. I'll explain that by way of an example. So we've got a transaction here where we're paying rent with $3,000 in cash. There's our, this is actually a journal that's just come up in front of you. So what you do is a debit to rent expense. So remember expenses are debit in nature, so we're debiting the rent account. Cash at bank is an asset, which is ordinarily a debit in nature, but because we're decreasing our bank account, we enter a credit. So there we have a debit for 3000 a credit for 3000 Debits must always equal credits. Another example of a transaction, we buy a desk for $800. Again, two accounts affected. Furniture and fittings, asset, debit in nature, debit $800. Cash at bank, also asset, also debit in nature, but because it's being decreased, we credit it. And last example, make a cash sale for $5,000. So forget about stock. Um, we're just selling $5,000. Again here, we've got our cash at bank account again, which is an asset, debit in nature. It's increasing. So we debit it. Sales is a revenue item, which is credit in nature. So we credit it. So, we need, so what you have there on those three transactions, there are the three journals to record those in the system, in the accounting system. From the journals, we then go to, we have to in the um, old manual days, had to post all those journals to ledgers. Now that's done automatically by the accounting software packages out there at the moment. The same with the balancing of all the ledgers, that's done. And then also the construction of the profit and loss statement and balance sheet. If you're using accounting software, it's a matter of just pushing a button on the report side of things. But um, when it was all done manually, you had to um, actually manually go through each ledger card, work out its balance, write it down, and, and construct the profit and loss statement and balance sheet. Okay, so here's the example for those three journals we just did. Um, we'll post them through to the ledger. So first one, remember, was our rent expense and cash. So this is our ledger. Remember I said debit on the left, credit on the right? So in the old days when you had the manual system, 
that little under cash at bank where you've got a line drawn down the middle of the page. So we've credited cash, so it's on the right. Rent is on the left hand side of the page. Second journal, our furniture and fit our new desk. Again, the cash is going down, it's credited. Furniture and fittings, debit on the left hand side. Last one, cash sale of 5,000. Sales, credit in nature goes on the right hand side. Cash at bank, debit in nature goes on the left hand side. So that's how you post to a ledger. As I said, we have to balance all the ledgers. Next step, so that's what we do. So in our cash at bank account, for example, we've got 5,000 worth of debits and 3,800 worth of credits. That actually means we've got a debit balance of $1,200. We've actually got money in the bank. Furniture and fittings, only one transaction, and rent and sales the same. So if you add up the balance of all the debits, 1,200 plus 800 is 2,000, plus 3,000 is 5,000. We've got $5,000 in total of our debit accounts balances and $5,000 for our one and only sales credit account. So our ledger balances. We've got $5,000 worth of balances on both the debit and the credit sides. So why am I telling you all this? This is just to, to explain how financial statements are actually put together. And again, I'm just emphasizing when you're looking at a profit and loss statement or a balance sheet, they're purely summary documents. Um, you don't know all the transactions such as these that make up. All you'll see on the balance sheet is cash at bank for $1,200. You don't know you know, how, how that's come about. It's just at 30 June, that's what's in the bank. Okay, so in addition to the profit and loss statement and balance sheets, that's sort of the, how it goes through. We've got a journals, we've got a, a ledger. Um, in the old days, you used to, to do a trial balance before you'd send it off to the typing pool to get typed up um, in, the, in the sort of final format. But don't worry too much about those anymore. And then you finally get your financial statements, your summary documents. Other documents that are available out there that people might have some use to at some stage are things such as debtors' age trial balances. So the accounting documents you can get out of the accounting system are not um, restricted to just a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. So a debtor's age trial balance, you're probably all familiar with that, you know, and, um, that just lists who owes you money and how old, how long it's been since that debt has been outstanding. Similarly for creditors, who do you owe and um, how long have you owed them? Now they, why would you bother looking at those documents? Well we look at them when we're doing a valuation for example. I said before the, the balance sheet might reflect the the historical cost or, or the, the for debtors for example it's all the invoices unpaid invoices that have been issued but if you get a debtors age trial balance and you find all those debtors are out in 120 days well why aren't the debtors paying and are they going to pay so is is the debtors balance even a legitimate asset or should it be written off or written down to some extent for non-recovery Similarly, things like sales summaries and customer summaries, that's the, the good thing about all these accounting packages, software packages out there is you can produce a myriad of reports and um, things like sales summaries will tell you, again, if you're doing a valuation, you, know, you might ask for a report that produces a, a, a listing of all your sales by particular product type and you might find that 98% of all your sales are one particular product. And if that product has just been superseded by some whiz-bang um, product by a competitor, well, in valuing the business, will they even have a business going forward because no one's going to buy their product in future? Or again, you can do sales summaries by customer. So uh, if you're analysing the business, you know, have they got one or two really big customers? So what happens if one of them leaves or goes broke, for example? Uh, will you have a business in the future? So that's the last when you're doing any sort of analysis, it's much easier rather than to get reams and reams of paper to ask for the actual accounting data file, um, which gives you, and then you can just produce whatever reports you want yourself. So that's something we typically ask for when doing a valuation or any sort of investigation. Okay, so that's um, sort of the halfway mark now, and we're just um, gone through how accounts are put together. So um, we've done that so that you can hopefully understand a bit better 
how people manipulate their financial statements. But before doing that, we might just say, you know, why would they manipulate their financial statements? Well, they might be applying for finance, so in which case they'll try and produce a profit and loss statement that obviously shows more rather than less profit and a balance sheet that shows more net assets rather than less. Reporting to investors as above. So, you know, most of the, the things that are in the papers concerning public companies are normally, you know, when the scandals going back into the thing like Enron and such things are all about ABC childcare centres, all those sort of matters are all about uh, management manipulating financial statements to try and make the performance of the of the business and the entity look better than it actually was. So, and that's obviously um, point number three there, the management re remuneration. That's um, quite often their um, motivation is if they're rewarded on short-term bonuses, on bonuses on short-term performance, then of course they'll be trying every year to do their best to increase profitability. Might be a valuation. So if you're purchasing it, this business, uh, you might be trying to influence the, the valuer to produce a set of a valuation that um, comes up with a lower number than it would have otherwise if you were selling the property, no, the business, sorry. Similarly for stamp duty and income tax, um, normally to avoid that as much as possible, you decrease it. Um, income tax, that's probably the most common reason people out there in the small, medium business world that uh, we tend to operate in. Than more so than the big end of town, um, their main purpose in even producing financial statements is to determine their taxable income. And of course, most people would prefer to pay less tax today uh, rather than more. So quantifying damages, for example, you might have a personal injury matter that, um, lo and behold, you'd try and, you know, not exaggerate, but try and obviously make the business look better prior to the the event. So it might be a as I say a personal injury to the to the main business driver, the main business owner, or it might be a some other form of business interruption such as a fire or an equipment breakdown. So um, the business owner would try and get the financial statements to tell the story that the um, business was going gangbusters leading up to the event and then lo and behold it suffers this massive decline straight after the event. And the last one there is in you know, property settlement for a family de facto or a commercial, if there's a shareholders dispute where, depending who the, uh, the client is, they'll um, be trying to manipulate things to, to tell a certain story. So the important thing to remember with manipulation though is normally it is that whatever you do in the current period will normally have an opposite effect in the following period and hopefully the examples I go through will explain that a bit better what I mean by that. So I'll go through half a dozen here methods of manipulation how, and these are legitimate things. So this is, I'm not talking here about you know, just non-disclosure of cash sales for example. That's, that's not manipulation, that's just blatant fraud. So that's just choosing not to even enter the, the sales in the accounting system to start with. So instead of depositing the cash into the bank account, you put the cash sale into your pocket and it never never hits the financial never hits the uh, financial records. So again that's you know another point that's very important. Because of the way the double entry accounting system works, if if the money's been deposited into the bank account, that's one side of the entry. So remember our debit to the bank, there has to be a credit go somewhere else. So, you know, we're often in doing valuations for matrimonial property settlement type matters told, oh, you know, wife says he's ripping all the business, all the cash out of the business. You know, well, if that's the case, if, if the cash was deposited into the, into the business's bank account in the first place to allow it to be ripped out, there must be an entry reflecting the withdrawal of cash from the bank account. So we'd have lots of credit entries to our cash at bank account there has to be a corresponding debit or the accounts won't balance, the balance sheet won't balance at the end of the day. So if you have all the accounting records 
and the ledgers, for example, and you can go back through and um, work out where the withdrawals were made to the husband in that example. You can then drill down back to the journal entry. So we're working our way backwards and we work out, okay, one side of the entry was credit cash. Where was the debit side of the entry? Now, the beauty of um, most of the uh, computerized accounting software packages is that you can normally hold your mouse over the transaction in the ledger if you're looking at a report on your screen of the uh, general ledger and double click and that'll take you back to the journal. So rather than having to trawl through pages and reams of paper, it is certainly a lot easier. Um, and you can find out what the other side of the entry is. Okay, so um, sorry, I was just up to where examples of manipulation, so the basis of accounting, depreciation methods, leases, capitalised versus expense, asset valuations and accounting the stock and the last one is probably the most common manipulation that uh, we see and I'll explain how, uh, how you can do that quite um, legitimately. Okay, so there's things called cash and accruals basis of accounting. So first we need to explain what exactly these two things mean. So on a cash system, revenue expenses are recognised only when the cash is received or paid out. However, under accruals, all the revenue and all the expenses are recorded when they're relevant to that period's revenue. So revenue is recorded when derived, which means when it's invoiced, and similarly for expenses, when you receive an invoice or perform a service, um, you receive a bill for it. So an example there is, for example, in a legal practice or an accounting practice, you do work for a client, you issue an invoice, invoice might be issued on the 29th of June, $10,000, it's not paid until the 10th of July. If you've got a, a profit and loss statement that's been produced under the cash basis of accounting, there is no cash received. So that work for that client, that $10,000, would not be recognised in the profit and loss statement until July. Under the accrual system though, you would recognise it as income and of course that would be going back to our debits and credits, we'd have a credit to our revenue account, sales, we need a debit, that would be debtors. So that rec represents, so what that has the effect of doing, under the accrual system we've got higher income and higher assets being our debtors. However, in the following period, when the cash actually comes in in July, well, we've already recognised the income, we don't have any need to recognise any more income, it's been recognised. So when the cash comes in, all that happened is you would put it into the bank account, which increases our bank account, and we'd decrease our debtor's balance by that trip to reflect the fact the debtor has paid. Whereas on a cash basis, we would recognise there would be no debtors because we don't um, take them up under a cash basis, and the money would just go straight debit bank credit income. So that's what I was saying before about whatever happens in one period, the reverse would happen in the following period. So the easiest way to tell whether you're looking at a set of financial statements that have been prepared on a cash basis or an accruals basis is look on the balance sheet, are there debtors and are there creditors? Now you might have some businesses that of course don't have debtors, so a retail shop for example would never have debtors, everyone pays then and there when they take delivery of the goods over the counter, but they would have creditors presumably unless they have to pay all their suppliers um, at the time of taking delivery, and if they're COD on terms for some reason, but ordinarily you'd expect to see it. So accruals is the more correct way in accounting theory because it proper better reflects the actual income and expenses. You've done the work, for example that bill for 10000 to your client, you've done the work, you've got a debt that's payable to you at that time, so you should record it in June. Um, and then when the money comes in, the money comes in. Okay, so a second form of manipulation is depreciation. Um, there's two methods of depreciating something. I, I gave a brief explanation earlier about what depreciation is. So remember it was the, um, you know, recognising the using up 
the utility value of an asset over time. So an example to explain the difference between straight line, which is also called prime cost method of depreciation and the diminishing value method. Assume we've got an asset, a desk, cost a big desk, cost $10,000. It's got a life of five years. So if we want to use the straight line method, that's easy. So over five years, that means our rate is 20%. Every year, depreciation is $2,000. That WDV in the second column stands for written down value. So remember on our balance sheet, in year one on the balance sheet, you would see uh, furniture and fittings, $10,000, less accumulated depreciation, $2,000 and a balance of $8,000. Year two, plant and equipment, uh, sorry, furniture and fittings, $10,000. Accumulated depreciation would now be $4,000 and we'd have a net value of $6,000. So on the right hand side there is ha what would happen if we adopted the diminishing value method. So the rule with this is the diminishing value rate is always one and a half times the straight line rate. So in this case, 20% becomes 30%, one and a half times. Okay. So in year number one, our asset that cost $10,000, we would depreciate by $3,000, being 30% of $10,000. Year two, we would, our depreciation charge would be $2,100, being 30% of $7,000. So 30% of the diminishing value of the asset. The diminishing value is the, is the value net of depreciation. So you can see what happens here is if we decide to choose option two, we actually have a higher expense in years one and two, but then in the later years, our expense isn't quite as great and it actually takes us longer to depreciate the asset. So which method should you use? Well, that's entirely up to you as the preparer of accounts and also for tax purposes, you're allowed to use either method. So in practice out there in a small medium business world, most people would use method two. They'd prefer to get a tax deduction this year of 3,000 and next year of 2,100 uh, and worry about the other later on. So over the life of the asset, you will still depreciate it by $10,000. So that's what I say. Most of these things are what's called timing differences. So it just purely affects the time at which the expense is recognised. Um, the total expense under both examples will be $10,000. It's just a matter of whether that takes five years to um, um, use up or whether it's six plus years to use up. Um, why do they even have these two methods? Well, the theory is that some assets lose more value early on. So things such as vehicles, um, you drive it out of the showroom, it tends to lose proportionally more of its value in the early years and then it starts to slow down at how it's losing value. So. If you had something like a vehicle, then the diminishing value method probably would better reflect how the asset is actually losing value. But it's not too complicated. You can basically just choose to use either method. And what you can do is either method for every individual asset. The only rule is once you've started using one method, straight line or diminishing value, you have to use that method for the remainder of the life of the asset. But one car you might decide to depreciate under a straight line method, and the other car, you might decide to depreciate under the diminishing value method. That's perfectly allowed for both accounting and tax purposes. So this is called capitalised, which essentially means recognised as an asset or expense. So remember our driveway example? This is basically just that one. So it's a question of categorisation. So again, for both accounting and tax purposes, the rule is, as I said earlier, that if you're actually improving something, it's a new asset, it's, you should capitalise it. Whereas if all you're doing is bringing it back to the state it was in before, that's a repair and you expense that. Uh, lease accounting is actually quite difficult to explain, I'll do my best to do so. What this really is all about is trying to um, recognise leases um, under the second way is you recognise it the same way as you would a higher purchase or a chattel mortgage. So under the first dot point, one way of accounting for leases is you treat them as rental payments. So the reason for doing that is you don't actually, under a lease, while it's, it's essentially just another form of financing, 
legally you don't own the asset. And that's why leased assets were never brought onto the balance sheet because it's not actually your asset. So you don't have legal title to it. The finance company does. Um, but what happened back, it dates back to the 1980s, um, and I think Alan Bond in particular and a couple of other of those entrepreneurs from the early to mid 80s, to try and make their balance sheets look as if they had very little debt, they pretty well leased everything. So they had huge lease expenses in their profit and loss account, but very little debt on their balance sheet. So for example, they might own $10 million worth of other assets and they were showing no debt because everything's leased. So they had net assets of $10 million. But what they actually had was also another $10 million worth of assets which were leased. So they had a $10 million asset and a $10 million liability being the debt owing on them. So what they really had was $20 million worth of assets and $10 million worth of liabilities. Or what, that's what's called the debt to equity ratio of 50%. But because they were showing everything as an expense, they were able to show a balance sheet which had zero liabilities and 100% equity or assets. So the accounting standards makers, for certainly for larger entities, remember those reporting entities I mentioned earlier, have to follow option two here, whereas you treat, you capitalise the asset, you bring it onto the balance sheet as an asset and you recognise the liability and you just treat it in the same manner as you would a higher purchase or chattel mortgage. Um, out there, I keep referring to small, medium business world, the tax rule is it's an expense and you just expense the lease rental payment. So you'll often see most people following rule number one because their accounts are predominantly prepared for the purpose of determining their taxable income. So but just be aware if you're reviewing a set of accounts and you see quite large lease expenses, there might be um, a lot more assets in the business than what is reflected on the balance sheet and also a lot more liabilities than what's reflected on the balance sheet. So we've got an original cost there, an example down the bottom, $100,000. We've taken out finance over five years with a 40% residual. So you could have done that either by way of a lease or a higher purchase or channel mortgage. If we do leasing, we show an expense every year of $18,044 and at the end of the time we pay out the $40,000 residual. That's when the asset would then um, appear on our balance sheet for $40,000. However, method two where we capitalise it, what you actually do is you show we had, you effectively depreciate it and claim the interest on the loan. The lease is treated like a principal interest loan um, as in a similar way to a higher purchase or a, or a um, chattel mortgage. So what you end up with there is on the far right hand side an asset and a liability on the balance sheet and you can see there that actually the way the principal interest loan is being repaid differently to how you're depreciating the asset your asset is actually worth less than your liability so that's normally my experience too that where you do have lease assets that are being just expensed straight to the profit and loss statement then um, if you actually do this principal interest calculation on the underlying finance facility and value the asset, you'll normally find you've got negative equity in it. That's the most common scenario anyway. Um, so another method of manipulation is how do we value assets. So remember I spoke before about the building we bought 10 years ago for 10, uh, $2 million that's now worth $10 million. So the balance sheet for the last 10 years has had that building on it for $2 million. We now recognise our, the value of our increased equity in it and value it up to the $10,000, uh, $10 million. So that's that asset revaluation reserve, if you remember from one of the very early slides. That's how we recognise our increased equity. Now, that revaluation is normally purely at the the director's discretion as to whether they want to revalue the asset. Um, and that would normally be to 
you know, better reflect what's currently there. But if they're the only people using the balance sheet, they know that that building that's sitting on the balance sheet for two million is really worth ten million. Um, they might not ever do it. If it's a public reporting entity, um, to do the revaluation and to um, get sign off by the auditors, because the auditors are going to verify that that the balance on the balance sheet is correct, they would probably need to get an independent property valuer to value it. Okay, and last but certainly not least is probably the most common method of manipulation, which is accounting for stock. So stock or inventory, there's three ways or bases of valuation, and they are cost, net realisable value, and replacement value. So cost is the most common because, remember, when we do our initial entry to reflect the acquisition of the stock, we would have debited stock and credited cash, and that'll be for the amount for which we actually paid or our cost price. So that's the most common. However, at the end of the year, uh, when you go around and do your stock take, you might actually find that your net realisable value, yeah, because it's become obsolete or it's old or it's uh, faded, whatever it might be, slightly damaged, your realisable value might be less than what your it costs you. Therefore, in theory, a prudent preparer of financial statements would reduce their value of their stock holding and um, take it up at the realisable value. Similarly, with the replacement value, the if it now costs because of, you know, probably most commonly at the moment, um, people who import stuff. So if the replacement value has gone up or down because of movements in exchange rates, then might, the decision might be made to revalue the stock to the current replacement value. Now, why this is important, general rule is the high, stock is the one account that affects both your profit and loss statement and your balance sheet. So closing stock is taken up as in determining your profit, and it's also an asset that's on the balance sheet. So if you increase your closing stock or your stock value, that has the effect of increasing profit. Higher stock, higher profit, higher assets. So if you want to manipulate your profit so that's higher, you try and adopt one of the alternative methodologies, whichever one gives you the highest stock number. Alternatively, for example, if you want to decrease your income for tax purposes, and all three methods here are perfectly legitimate for both tax and accounting purposes, you can go down uh, go through all your stock items and value them all at whatever gives you the you know the lowest possible value, and that's perfectly legitimate. And again, um, similar to what I was saying before, you can do this same as with depreciating assets. You can choose each individual asset which basis of depreciation to use. You can do the same thing here with stock. That it has to be each. Yes, one item of stock you can value at cost, one at net realisable value, and one at replacement value. The only rule is whatever you value, whatever this year's closing stock is, becomes next year's opening stock. So if you've adopted the cost price now, at 30 June 14, for example, opening stock the 1st July 14 has to be the same dollar value. But when you come to 30 June 15, if you've still got that stock, on hand, hopefully you wouldn't because it must be getting pretty old in the tooth if you have, you might decide to use some alternative method. So each year end you can change your method of valuation for each individual item of stock, but whatever you do has to be the opening value for the following year. So again that's that timing difference coming in because again as I said, higher your closing stock, higher your profit, well higher your opening stock, lower your profit. So if you increase your stock value at year end to give yourself a higher profit number, that will have the opposite effect in the following year. So, I mean, I've often seen it over time preparing people's tax returns where they every year they go through their stock and try and value it as low as possible to give themselves as low a profit as possible, um, and legitimately do so. It's not um, it's not fraud. It's not um, yeah cheating the tax man or anything like that, it's um, perfectly allowed, um, but every year they go through and they 
use whatever legitimate means they can to reduce their stock value, to reduce their stock, has the opposite effect in the following year, so they've got to go through it all again at the next year end and try everything they can to reduce their stock, reduce their stock. Then after you know five years they come to sell the business, well of course they want as much as possible for the stock. So when they do sell it then for its you know what its realizable value is, um, suddenly all those what they've been reducing their stock by over the years comes back to bite them um, and they'll have to pay the tax they have been um, deferring. I won't say avoiding because as I keep saying all these methods of manipulation, these legitimate methods of manipulation are always just timing differences we deferring the effect one way or the other, either up or down. So just finally some other terminology to be aware of when you're looking at financial statements. You're normally looking at um, the, the business assuming that it's a going concern. If this thing hasn't made a profit in 10 years and it's only being propped up by the owners, you know, tipping money into it, and it's questionable where, how long that'll happen for, then you have to question whether it's a going concern. If that's the case, when you're looking at the assets on the balance sheet, you know, if, if the liquidator is about to be appointed, all that plant and equipment might be worth half or 20% of what it's on the balance sheet for. The stock, again, if you could sell in the normal course of business, yeah, you might get the value that's on the balance sheet. But if you've got to dump it all somewhere in one big, um, one big hit, you might not get anything like that. Um, everyone thinks that accountants check everything to the last cent and everything is correct to the last cent. But you should be aware there's this concept out there called materiality. And that basically means um, it's 95% right and certainly no more than 10% wrong. So as a rule for auditors, um, if they are, for example, checking the stock by way of the stock take and tracing it all back, and the stock on the balance sheet says a million dollars, they do all their checks and whatever and find out the stock is really only worth $800,000, they'll insist that the accounts are restated to 800000 because it's greater than a 10% difference to what they think it should be. If, however, they do all their checks and they find they reckon it's worth $970,000, so only a 3% difference to the million dollars on the balance sheet, that's a less than 5% difference. So they can't say the accounts are not true and fair. If the accounts, if the balances on the accounts are within 5% of what they think the, re the absolutely correct value is, the auditors can't say the accounts are wrong. And if it's between 5 and 10%, it's up to the auditors uh, to decide whether they, they what's called qualify the accounts. Um, the other thing to be aware of is, is cash flow versus profit. So you can often have businesses that are very profitable but have very little cash flow. So for example they might have a lot of sales but if they're not converting those sales to cash because the debtors balance is going up, 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 um, you might, you know, that brings into a, a question the going concern assumption. Uh, Value, that's another whole topic for another day in terms of if you're trying to value something, are you valuing it and you're looking at the balance sheet, are you looking at market value, are you looking at um, net realizable value, are you looking at replacement value, all those sort of ideas and issues. Um, things called provisions. So what a provision is, is you think there's a chance, for example, you might not collect all your debtors. Um, you'll take up a journal for a thing called a provision for doubtful debts, whereby you'll recognise. So if you ever see a provision, that normally means it, they're not the, the accounts preparers are not 100% certain. If they knew for sure the debtors weren't collectible, they should be written off as bad debts and the debtors balance reduced without showing a provision for doubtful debts. It would just be a pure bad debt. Contingent events, I spoke about them um, earlier with the, uh, the potential law case, it's those sort of things and they won't be because there is no liability or there is no asset that has a, a legally enforceable um, behind it, they won't be shown on the balance sheet, just be aware such things can exist. And finally if something happened after the balance sheet date, so as at 30 June when the um, balance sheet was struck you might have thought all your debtors were collectible. Um, but maybe you're now looking 
we're now sitting end of February. Um, we've got the benefit of hindsight to be able to work out um, you know, the last eight months whether those debtors are actually all collectible. And if we're doing a valuation, we can refer to that. So last thing, we're just about right spot on time. I'll let you get out of here. So um, when you're reading financial statements, the most important things to be aware of. Who prepared the financial statements? Are they, prepared, are they audited? So the, in the uh, highest level of um, assurity you can have is if they're audited by an auditor. But as I said, uh, just be aware they, you know, they can be slight, five, up to 5% differences there that the auditor can't insist the account get changed. But generally speaking, you'd expect those accounts to be pretty all right. At the other end is a set of accounts that are produced you know, as of the 26th of February by pressing a button on the client's MYOB statement and it's just by the bookkeeper and there hasn't been a, an actual qualified accountant go through and check everything's been posted properly and categorised properly. What purpose were they prepared? Are you setting, looking at a set of accounts so you know, often misrepresentation type cases Someone buys a business and all they're given is a profit and loss statement that's just been typed up. Well, yeah, how, how reliable is that as opposed to looking at a set of audited financial statements? The other thing is just make sure you're either looking at the entity performance or the business performance. So you might look at a profit and loss statement and show that, you know, and all you do is you go straight to the bottom line, oh, there's a great profit there, net profit for year, $1 million. But included, if you actually looked in the detail and worked out that $1 million included a profit on a sale of a property for $2 million, well really the underlying business that forms most of the operations of that entity has actually lost a $1 million for the year. So just be aware of whether you're looking at the profit and loss statement for the company and if it does other things as well as operate a business that you're trying to analyse, then just make sure you strip out all the non-business type um, items in there. And I've mentioned a few things about the reporting entity versus the non-reporting entity and how detailed the accounts are. Okay, so as I said, if you do have any questions, um, we'll get back to you with those, uh, with answers, and probably circulate the questions and the answers to everyone. Um, otherwise, if you do have, if anything pops up, you do have a question, um, you've got our contact details and just shoot us a quick email or a phone call and we could probably answer that at, at some stage. So thank you very much for listening and, and tuning in and um, I've managed to finish pretty well on time. So thanks again and um, I hope that's been of some use to you and um, good evening. Thank you.